that was when my father said, you know, why don't you want to become a doctor? And I told him, I said, I didn't know girls could be doctors. And, and he told me, he said, you can be, you can be anything. And he, you know, after I had dinner with him that night, you know, I went to bed and all I could remember from that was he told my dad, my father telling me that I could be anything. And I grew up with that. That became my my mantra. I mean, I'm, a, now I'm the eldest of two brothers and and a sister. And I don't think my brothers really appreciated the fact that, you know, I was going to be empowered. I became empowered. I became activated in that moment. And, and uh, you know, it was from that pivotal moment where I, I believed that, you know, I could do, I could do anything. And more importantly, that my father, my mother as well, believed I could do anything, really set in motion, a lot of different efforts that I came to realize in different ways. And so each at each time that I, I would be making a decision or, or make or considering what I was going to do next, I never saw it through the lens of of whether I could do something or not. It was more along the lines of, you know, do I want to do this and how well do I want to do it? And that's what what kind of drove me through it. That's retired Vice Admiral Raquel Bono, the first U.S. Navy medical officer to achieve the rank of three-star admiral. Raquel, or Rocky as she's known by some, is a medical doctor, business school graduate, and was the second director of the Defense Health Agency, one of the largest and arguably most complex healthcare systems in the world. The Defense Health Agency is responsible for delivering healthcare at more than 300 facilities across the globe, overseeing the TRICARE Health Insurance Plan, training military medical personnel for the home front and the field, and ensuring the health and readiness of military service members, whether their care is at home, abroad, or on the battlefield. After leaving the Defense Department at the end of 2019, in early 2020, before most Americans were thinking about the COVID-19 pandemic, Rocky took a position helping Washington State's Governor Jay Inslee by leading the state's efforts to respond to the outbreak. She's now a consultant, the chief health officer at Viking Cruises, and a board member at Humana, the Fortune 500 company that's the third largest health insurance provider in the United States. I've known Rocky for five years, and I think she's one of the most insightful minds about leadership as well as healthcare that I've encountered in my career. Today, we're going to discuss healthcare, about what it takes to break the molded stereotypes that people have about others and sometimes about themselves, and where leaders should be focusing their time in this increasingly volatile, complex, and ambiguous world. Rocky, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. It's exciting to be back in touch with you and to, to share some time with you again. Yeah, I always enjoy our conversations. I always find that, uh, you know, even though I worked as a consultant in space where you were, I was always learning more from you than you could have possibly learned <laughs> from me. <laughs> You were always a great sounding board for me, Jason. Oh, you know, it was it was always something where... I think that what I really valued about our conversations was that you gave me this space to kind of, you know, draw out um, a framework of my thoughts. And then you kind of helped me close the gap on on where I felt we needed to work on. So uh, there were always those were always good, rewarding conversations for me. Yeah, well, that's great to hear. That's great. to hear. I wanted to start by asking you just a little bit about, you know, sort of a a little bit about your background. Um, There's so much to your resume. You know, you're a a burn surgeon, a naval officer. You've been a federal government agency head. And a lot of that doesn't sort of traditionally fit the mold um, of what people expect. You know, 
And I'm curious, what inspired you to go into the Navy, to go into the into medicine, to pursue the types of things that you pursued across your career? Oh, you know, I I, I guess um, there's so many things that you know, and it and it always starts for me. It always starts from my family of origin, you know, and and how I grew up and and how my um, what expectations, if any, were put on me, and I think that. I'd, I'd always known that I was going to be going to college. That was kind of an expectation. But when I was a very young girl, you know, I, one of the things that I was allowed to do in, in my family, because I was the eldest child, was that I, I would be the one that got to wait up for my father when he came back from work. And my father was doing his surgical residency at the University of Minnesota. And so oftentimes he would spend, you know, 48 to 36 hours away from from home uh, because he was on call. And when he would, you know, finally be able to come home, I would wait for him and, and have dinner with him. And I remember, you know, as a seven-year-old, I was about six or seven when I told him that I wanted to, you know, I wanted to work in the hospital too, so that, you know, I could I could see him every day and I wouldn't have to wait for him to come home from being on call. And, you know, you have to remember, Jason, when, uh, you know, when I was growing up, there were just set stereotypes for, you know, what women, you know, could expect to pursue, you know, teacher, nurse, um, you know, homemaker. And, you know, when I told him that I wanted to work in the hospital, the only thing I knew at the time to say was that, you know, I would become a nurse. And, and that way I could see him every day. And that was when my father said, you know, why don't you want to become a doctor? And I told him, I said, I didn't know girls could be doctors. And, and he told me, he said, you can be, you can be anything. And he, you know, uh, after I had dinner with him that night, you know, I went to bed and all I could remember from that was he told my dad, my father telling me that I could be anything. And I grew up with that. That became my my mantra. I mean, I'm a, now I'm the eldest of two brothers and and a sister, and I don't think my brothers really appreciated the fact that you know I was going to be empowered. I became empowered. I became activated in that moment, and and uh, you know it was from that pivotal moment where I I believed that you know I could do I could do anything, and more importantly that my father, my mother as well, believed I could do anything, really set in motion a lot of different efforts that I came to realize in different ways. And so each at each time that I, I would be making a decision or, or, make, or considering what I was going to do next, I never saw it through the lens of, of whether I could do something or not. It was more along the lines of, you know, do I want to do this and how well do I want to do it? And that's what, what kind of drove me through it. So, you know, it was, it was it, one it was, of those profound moments, right? Yes. It was an epiphany. It yeah. was, it was one of those, you know, moments that really galvanized me and, and it was a defining moment for me. And, and I think that, you know, go, you know, fast forward, I'd been, I'd been doing this. I'd been, you know, pursuing medicine. I'd be, I was the, I had become a surgeon. I'd gone into the surgical field, the general surgical field. I was the first female to graduate from the Navy surgery program, um, but I was the second female to start. So, you know, I did, that was that was something that I went ahead and I pursued surgery and and I loved it and felt I was very competent at it. But it was it was something where I was the only one there and yeah. and. Um, and so, you know, when I became a mom and my daughter is telling me, you know, or asking me what I do, I'm telling her, I'm giving the whole, the whole thing. I'm telling her about serving our country and not everyone gets to wear a uniform and, and that I'm also a doctor and I get to take care of patients and, and I, I get to take them to the operating room as a surgeon. And I'm explaining to her what that process is like about taking care of people that need doctors. And when I finished telling her this story, she, you know, she's so solemn and she looks at me and she goes, mama, can boys be doctors too? And, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it was, that was another defining moment for me because I had been living my life believing that I could be anything. And 
I guess a part of me made that assumption that if I was living that life, that my own daughter would understand that she could be anything. And she did. But it was so funny because I hadn't realized that the other piece of that was she wanted to know if boys could do this stuff. You know, <laughs> right, do these things too. Friend. Yeah. Do you think it's you know the, the comment that your dad uh, made made me think of these moments that you know we as parents have with our children? Um, yeah. and we'll say things, and I, I don't know. Did he know the impact that he had on you when he made that comment? You know. Um, I don't know that, you know, in that moment that he was, he was thinking, okay, if I don't tell her this now, uh, you know, um, but I think that it wasn't so much that he had to make sure and, and fit that into parenting. It's as I, as I look back on, on him and his family of origin, and I look at the legacy that has come from my dad and my, my grandparents. I realized that one of my my dad's role models was not only his parents, but especially his mother, who he felt was somebody that um, was uh, a a very accomplished and effective teacher and leader and somebody who understood, you know, how to make things happen. And so my father was, I like to tell people, my father was the very first feminist I'd ever met. You know, mm. he'd always been an advocate of bringing more women into medicine and especially into surgery. And he'd always been very clear that he didn't see any reason why among myself and my brothers or and my sister, that there should be any reason why we couldn't compete, you know, in our, in our chosen area on, you know, on level footing. So... I think, you know, he didn't just tell this to me. He told this to my siblings. You know, we had a whole bunch of, you know, we had the four of us going out there believing that we could do anything. And, you know, and how we chose to express that, uh, I think that's the part my dad didn't have. You you know, he didn't know where this was going to end up. Oh, right. (laughs) You know, but, you know, but I'll I'll give you, you know, uh, you know, a preview of, of what happened is that, You know, I retired as a three-star admiral, and my brother, who also served in the Navy, also retired as as an admiral. So I don't know how – and there was a period of time when my brother and I were serving on active duty together, and we were the only brother-sister combination in the Navy who had two flag officers who were concurrently serving. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. uh, So who had the most stars at the end? Well, I, you know, my brother knows that I outrank him, so there's no, there's no question there. <laughs> As the oldest do. <laughs> well, you know what? But he made Admiral first, and and you know he was the first one to in our family to make Admiral, and you know I just uh, to this day I know that part of what he ended up doing was making sure that you know that whenever he got a chance he would he would help tee up other people to know uh, what I was doing. And, Mm. you know, shortly after he made flag, then I got my first star. And it was actually my brother who promoted me to my my first star. Yep. Oh, wow. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of which, so certainly breaking a mold in medicine, but why the, why the Navy and what was the Navy (laughs) like, you know, it's really interesting. So I, um, one of my most formative memories I had considered my dad's a Vietnam vet and I had, considered going into the Navy and, you know, my parents are very much like yours. You can be anything you, you want. But yeah. I'll never forget. It was the only time my father said, Hey, do you want to go on a drive? It was the only time. And mm-hmm. in, on the drive, he said to me, are you sure about 150 times? And I ultimately ended up going into a different profession. But around that same time that I was thinking about the Navy, one of the biggest events that that was happening was the tailhook scandal and the Mm. Navy wasn't necessarily seen as a hospitable place for, uh, for women. Yeah. And, you know, so I think of, think about that, you know, you're, you're, you're a part of a small group being a doctor and a woman, um, during Mm. your time, but also in the Navy, you know, there are not many women in the Navy at the time. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, You know, it was, 
It is kind of interesting as I reflect back on that time. You know, I had decided to join the Navy not not because of, of something that really I felt some kind of alliance with the Navy. As a matter of fact, my grandfather had been had served alongside with the US Army during World War II. And my father grew up in in an army post in the Philippines. I mean, that's what my, my dad knew was the army and my dad had served as um, in the Navy in the reserves. And so when it came time, part of my decision making to join the Navy had more to do with uh, the Navy was uh, the one that gave me that insight into what I could do with a, a scholarship to medical school through the Navy and what that looked like. And because my dad had was in the Navy and the Navy Reserves at the time. I think I gravitated to that, and mm-hmm. um, my brother went to the Naval Academy. But you know, when I when I joined the Navy, I, I, I don't know that I was very conscious of the fact that I was going to be in such a small cohort of one. I didn't, you know. I mean. I had it sounds of, like you were trying to narrow it down. <laughs> well, I, you know, it's because, you know, of course, I knew when I was going to medical school that about, you know, about in my medical school, we had about 30% of us were women. And so, and, and just, a, just the application process for medical school, you know, was something that I was coming through an era where, you know, it still wasn't as commonplace for, for women to pursue a career in medicine. And then, then I joined the Navy and, you know, I didn't do my, <laughs> I didn't study the data. I didn't study the numbers to know that I was going to be like the only female in, in the training program and the only female period, because we didn't have, we didn't have female surgeons for a while. They didn't start showing up until um, later in my, my residency training program. And so, you, you know, I don't know that I really saw what I was doing as being so, you know, gender influenced as much as I saw, you know, okay, this is what people who are successful do. These are, you know, these are things that I know that I can do. And here's what I'm trying to do when it comes to medicine and taking care of people. And being empowered like that, I I wonder sometimes, you know, almost that blindness, you know, that for so many people who aren't empowered, if you are empowered, you have this kind of blindness to the belief that some in the world think that you shouldn't be doing something and that can propel you. Um, Yeah. yeah. You know, I think, I think that's a really good way of, of describing it. I, you know, I think that what I what I've come to realize now as I look back on it is that I wasn't constrained by something that limited my vision of of what the art of the possible could look like. You know? And right. so because I wasn't constrained, um, and because I didn't consider that I was I was in a situation where I might be disadvantaged. I didn't react or respond in a disadvantaged way. Right. Does that right. make sense? Yeah. Oh, it does. It does. It does completely. And, you know, I think for so many people, they're limited by what they're, I think we all, you know, all, most children have a natural desire to please, you know, please mm-hmm. our parents, please society, live up to our expectations. And a lot of the research shows that it's not until your adolescent years that Mm -hmm. constraints start getting placed on that. And it narrows. I like the way that you, you know, the way you describe that, because what it really does is narrow your vision. Instead of taking Mm -hmm. a sort of broad lens, we start to narrow the lens. And it's not necessarily that anyone said, hey, you can't do this, but you've sort of self-selected your way out of it because you believe the world is yeah. telling you that yeah and i think exactly that, yeah. so i was going to ask you a question so you know there have been a ton of shows about navy lawyers like jag oh. criminal investigators <laughs> like ncis but i don't think there's a, maybe short of star trek <laughs> there's never been a show about navy doctor and i always thought that personally like being a doctor and being a doctor at a place like the navy would be, just seem fascinating 
So yeah. I, I was just curious, what is what is the life of a, a, a naval officer, who, a navy, naval medical officer like? Yeah. Oh, well, you know, I think that is, you know, first off, they don't have a show about that yet. So <laughs> Good point. Right. <laughs> yeah, Maybe your show, next yeah. project. <laughs> yes, right, right. So, um, you know, I found it. I, you know, I found it exciting. I, I just found, I, I could not believe that I was, you know, I had access and opportunity to do things that, you know, that I'd only read about or that I didn't even know existed, you know, um, first off, just, just becoming a doctor and be deciding to go into surgery was just, just thrilling, you know, I mean, becoming fulfilling and achieving that lifelong ambition to be able to help people in that way. And what I started realizing being a naval officer, though, was, you know, I was not only serving my patients, I mean, I was serving the country, you know, I mean, I thought, that's incredible. Um, you know, who gets to do that? <laughs> you know, yeah, who, the blessing of both, right? Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. You know, and, and um, I just thought, that was so exciting. And, and I think the other piece too, that was, that was going on. And I, you know, I, I, I'm not, I wasn't aware of it um, in the moment and I'm, you know, it's only upon reflection. And as I became more senior that I realized that the additional blessing I was experiencing was understanding leadership and what leadership really needed to look like in order to make meaningful change and, and how a person prepares themselves to understand what the what the change needs to be and how to help large numbers of people, large organizations help them achieve that. And that was something that I know, excuse me, I know my my civilian colleagues were not getting that same type of exposure in their medical career development. And I I know now since leaving the military what an incredible gift I have received from my military upbringing in understanding leadership and, and how it's supposed to work. Um, because I can tell you, just like, I mean, you know, you know the, the military is a cross-section of the U.S. And, and we need leadership in all sectors. And right. not everybody learns about really effective leadership the same way I did. Actually, a really, really good point that you're making is there something in your mind about being in the military that exposes you to the concept of leadership at an earlier yeah. point in your career? Yeah. Oh, well, I think that that's something that is a part of the legacy of, of the military is teaching a person how to develop skills in, you know, unit leadership, um, organizational leadership. You know, and then being able to understand that in, you know, a global sense that that leadership uh, needs to really be 360. You know, how do you lead those that follow you? How do you lead across your colleagues? And then more importantly, how do you lead up to the people that you report to? Yeah. And, you know, I think that's something that the military really starts that very early on in your career. Um, yeah, because they, it, yeah, I'm kind of reflecting on, you know, having done a lot of, uh, spent a lot of time with people in highly technical fields, whether it's mm -hmm. information technology or it's healthcare or, you know, it could be any field that requires architects and engineers that a lot of times in the beginning of their career, they're almost um, entirely focused on their technical specialty. Yeah. And that, we, we often find that their leadership development, their development as leaders, and even their development in terms of thinking of the whole organization starts really late. And maybe that's a lesson that I think maybe the private sector can pick up from the military, putting that focus mm -hmm. on the big picture a little bit earlier. Yeah. 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 I, you know, I, I certainly think that, that that would help so many organizations. And I think certainly this, you know, across multi sector thinking in that in that regard, you know, having other people appreciate that. And that is, you know, that is a challenge in the medical field, though, too, because you do spend so much time at your craft. But, you know, but because of, of the approach that I was 
that I was observing and that I was trying to develop myself was that, you know, at every stage, you know, what other leadership attributes and skills can you acquire mm. and, and how can you best put that into play? Kind of collecting them and throwing them in your wagon as you care. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, exactly I right. you probably don't remember this, but, you know, speaking of impactful conversations, but I remember the first time that I met you and, you know, we sat down and it was with a group of consultants. There were consultants uh, who were working with me, consultants from Corn Ferry. And we were mm -hmm. talking about executive development at the Defense Health Agency and your vision for it, and where you were headed. And I remember one of my colleagues asked you, you know, ultimately, you know, what, what's your vision for the Defense Health Agency? And you said to revolutionize healthcare. And we, you obviously don't know this because you left, we were all taken aback. We were like, wow, that, and because you laid out what your sort of vision and how you could imagine that. And I think a lot of times people, you know, we were, we were expecting something like to make sure that we have the highest quality care for our nine, you know, million, million beneficiaries or, or something on a much more tactical or operational level or something that was narrow in its, focus. Uh, okay. I'm curious by, about what you meant by that and maybe what we can learn from. Um, yeah. DHA. Well, I, you know, this is, and I do remember that conversation and, and I, I hope that at a minimum that all of you got the sense that I'd been thinking about this for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, that part was clear. <laughs> okay, good. And you good. know another interesting thing that was clear, I'll tell you, that was impactful uh -huh. on people? Because we had the group of consultants, and then we also had sort of the people who were working in our assistants. You know, one mm -hmm. striking thing, you, you know, spoke to the consultants, and we talked, and then you went around the room, and you asked every person, no matter how young they were, no matter what role they were in, what their thoughts were. And that was the other thing that really stuck out to us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good, good. Because that that was always an important piece for me, um, and it, it helped validate things. But you know that that when you ask me that question, when when somebody asked me that question about what did you know what did I see, the part that that struck me was I I knew and I still believe that healthcare uh, could be so much better. We have such tremendous you know, accomplishments in the technological space. And we have incredible minds that are looking at new, new therapies and new medications and new procedures and new ways of doing things and, and gaining new knowledge about disease and, and, you know, conditions that are harmful or that need to be corrected. Um, yet we have a system that is, is largely hostile to the patient and, I felt really strongly that if we could, in the Defense Health Agency, recognizing that we are a microcosm of the larger U.S. sector, both health and the general population, if we could do something that would truly design or redesign a healthcare system that served patients for what they were going through and what they needed help for at the time or to help prevent these things from happening to them, becoming, you know, having them be a partner in their own healthcare system. If we could do it through the Defense Health Agency, then we could help revolutionize healthcare for the U.S. And that's, that's what I was seeing was DHA would be the proof of concept for the rest of the U.S. healthcare system. And, you know, I think that there are several instances where where we did it, you know, but <laughs> we made it happen. The, um, and, and I'll definitely, I'll ask you about that. I, one of the things that sort of stuck out to me, to your point about the microcosm, you know, mm -hmm. um, at DHA, you're not just the healthcare providers, which, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of hospitals, yeah. research and development, you know, I kind of equate a lot of people don't know the story of Major Joseph Letterman, but during the Civil War and the Battle of Antietam, he sort of invented our current emergency yeah. response model. But you guys are the paramedics. You're the, mm -hmm. um, you know, the insurance, you know, yes. running one of the largest. 
So you had this opportunity to not just experiment with the healthcare delivery part of it, but almost every aspect of healthcare. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, so where, what, what things stood out, stood out for me when you're uh, in that experiment? So, you know, you, you know, Jason, what you just said was really pivotal. I mean, not only did DHA, you know, not only, and not, let me just speak about it as a military health system. Not only did the military health system have its own healthcare plan, TRICARE, the military health system also had the hospitals and clinics. And then the other piece, um, you know, two other pieces that the military health system already had assigned to them were the providers. You know, we had nurses, doctors, techs, corpsmen, medics who were all in uniform, who were, who were there as part of the organic assets of the military health system. And we also had patients who, because of service to our country, were eligible for care in our system. So we had people who were enrolled into our system. We had, we had the healthcare plan that we pretty much designed. And then we had all the people that supported it, the people and the infrastructure to support that. So we had all the major pieces of a healthcare organization, of a healthcare system. And in my mind, if we couldn't get it right with all those big pieces, then it was going to be daunting you know, for everybody, for anybody to try and, and, and get it closer to, to right. So, um, so we, you know, take looking at it through those, through that particular lens, you know, for me, what, what it did is it, it broadened my maneuver space. It, it made what might be possible seem, seem so much more, um, rich from, you know, in all the areas that I could look because it didn't necessarily have to be one single solution that was going to fix everything. It was going to be a, a combination across all of those areas. And it, it probably gave you a unique perspective of being able to see it from the lens of someone who is the leader of all the different aspects of the health system and how mm -hmm. the cascading impacts of, of changes to insurance or changes to care or quality, um, yeah. quality standards. The, um, what is the, the history of why, you know, the defense health agency is relatively new. What's the history of why the military wanted to bring it together? Well, you know, it, it's, it wasn't an original thought. <laughs> you know, it, it actually did. And, and, you know, I think that was probably something that, that, you know, with any kind of change or helping to undertake any type of management of change, you know, it, it is it is kind of interesting when you start pulling the thread and looking at, at the origins of change efforts. This was something that since 1948, since after World War II, that people looked at, you know, how, how we took care of our troops in the battlefield. And when they were off the battlefield and, and convalescing or needing care at home, and it was really recognized early on, and it's, it, it isn't a surprise, and it shouldn't be a surprise, that across Army, Air Force, and Navy, and the Marines, who are, are a part of Navy, but have, you know, an, an addition, you know, have, their, have a part of the healthcare sec, uh, system themselves, it was important to realize that a lot of what we did in medicine in taking care of people were pretty similar across all the services. So, you know, how you do an appendectomy in a Navy hospital is going to be pretty, it's going to be pretty identical to how you do an appendectomy in an Army hospital or, you know, an Air Force hospital. And, you know, uh, because we are a microcosm of the U.S. healthcare system, all of us, uh, all of us, you know, all clinicians had very similar training programs, had similar certification and, um, you know, uh, programs that not only train them, but that they had to meet certain criteria to be considered successful or board certified or licensed. And the same thing for, for nurses and physical therapists and for lab techs and for radiologists and radiology techs. So about 85% of what we did in, in healthcare, in military healthcare, was pretty similar. So over time, since, since World War II, there had been a number of people that had looked at this. And, you know, like 
if you're if you pay attention to the private sector, then you know at certain points that that in order to gain efficiencies so that you can improve your margins, improve your operating leverage, and so that you can find additional resources to recapitalize and to continue to build or grow your business or, or create create more services, you really have to look very closely within to see how well are you improving your operating leverage and, and how well are you, um, you know, optimizing your resources so that you don't have too much overlap and you don't create too many gaps in your services. So, you know, I wish I could, I could say that there was, you know, a group of people that woke up and, you know, saw the light. This had been actually coming about for some time. And uh, what was new with the Defense Health Agency is that we actually had legislation that now directed the services to contribute to the stand-up and the operationalizing of the Defense Health Agency. And that was the thing that was different from all the other conversations. Well, I think about what you say that the idea or said about the idea sort of originating back in World War II. And I think about the conversation that we were having about, you know, how sometimes we as people sort of like narrow our focus and don't see the possibilities. What do you what do you think is really critical for leaders in terms of seeing the broad picture and leading change you had mentioned? Because, you know, something happened between World War II and you know, what was it, 2013, when the defense <laughs> started. But <laughs> There's a lot of things that happened. You know, there was something like 20, 21 different studies of the military health system, and, <laughs> and 18 of the 21 agreed that we needed to bring more things together. But I think, you know, the challenge for, for change management for any leader, I think, is not is to avoid constraining yourself by the voices that want to say why something can't happen Mm -hmm. and, and all the reasons why it it shouldn't happen or couldn't happen or, or, you know, why the system isn't going to be able to change. And, and so what I oftentimes would ask people when, you know, they would, they would give me, you know, they would do the analysis and they tell me all the reasons and all the challenges about something why, you know, why it couldn't, you know, happen in, in, in a certain way or happen at all. And I would, I would ask the question and I said, well, can you tell me what we would need to look like in order for us to accomplish this, whatever this happened to be, you know? And, and so I would try to turn the question into a slightly different way. It's, you know, don't, you know, <laughs> I don't tell me why this can't happen and don't tell me all the ways to, to know Tell, you know, in in, NO, tell me what we would need to look like or help me understand what we would need to look like in order to make this more responsive to our patients, faster turnaround time in getting them their medications or being able, what would we need to look like in order for them to be able to have an appointment for their next visit before they even leave the hospital? What would we need to look like in order to make that happen? It's really Oh, sorry. It would bring up, no, no, I, I was just going to say, it created a different conversation. Yeah, you know, and I wonder whether it's about perspective, because I, yeah. you know, one thing I often hear people talk about, and, you know, it predates COVID, but certainly afterwards, is that there's so much change, or they struggle so mm-hmm. much with change. And one of the things that always struck me about the way that people often talk about change is it's almost like they're describing it like they're a leaf in the wind being blown <laughs> by this change. Oh, yeah. And I was, I was wondering whether that framework or that perspective is a part of what gets in the way that, you know, that maybe we should be more active or, you know, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I, I like how you said that. I mean, it, it does, you know, um, I think people find it maybe – find it almost a default to feel like that they are a leaf in the wind and, and that they can't be a participant in this. And, and I think that's the piece why I asked people at the end of the meeting and I went around the table to get in everyone's view is so that they would realize that they are the architects of whatever we're getting ready to do. 
Yep. They are, you know, they are, they're, they have their, you know, it's part of developing their stake in, in what's going to happen and, and empowering them in some way to help define and describe what this is going to look like. So, I mean, that was, that was why at all of my meetings, you know, I'd always reserve a few minutes to go around the table and ask people their thoughts. Yeah. So they could become sort of active participants mm -hmm. in it. You know, I, thinking about, about our conversation overall and sort of some of the difficult challenges healthcare organizations face and their employees, you know, it's been a very difficult and tough couple of years within the industry, you know, certainly since the pandemic began. But even before that, there was a lot of turmoil. And, you know, a lot of our focus has been on healthcare, but I think to some extent, almost every industry is being disrupted but right now yeah. on some level. And I wonder what your thoughts are on what leaders should sort of be focused on um, now that we have so much uncertainty and things have become so, so ambiguous, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. You know, um, I heard, I believe it was Secretary Albright who said, you know, a leader's responsibility is to help people understand what the future is going to look like or, or is to help make the future you know, something to, words to that effect. I, I thought it was just real. I'll have to I'll have to find that again. I, I know I jotted it down somewhere, but and I think that that remains true, especially when there is um, ambiguity and uncertainty. I mean, that is truly why you know anyone can lead when you know the seas are calm, but when the seas are not calm and there's there's ambiguity and, and there's uncertainty and, and, you know, maybe even a little bit of danger if we're using the sea analogy, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's when true leadership reveals themselves, you know, it's in those moments. Yeah. yeah. So I think that that's something that, that, um, you know, that's, that it's needed. And I like what you just said, it's needed across all sectors. It's not just medicine, it's across all sectors. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think the, the part, I, I just had an earlier conversation with somebody, I said, and I, I said this, I said, you, you know, leaders don't ever want to waste a good crisis, too, to make meaningful change happen. <laughs> so true. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> no. You know, one interesting thing in thinking about what you were just saying there, it's, you know, in, in a situation that's sort of one of my takeaways from that is in a situation filled with a lot of uncertainty, sort of vision in your purpose can almost be a lighthouse that steers you away from the rocks or, you know, continuing yeah. with our sea metaphors or even a North star that can kind of navigate you that if you know what your purpose is as an individual mm -hmm. or in an organization, you know what your vision is. And when you're in that uncertain situation and you're trying to decide, do I go left or do mm -hmm. I go right? And if let's say my purpose is to help people, you can always mm -hmm. say, well, which of these two things is most likely? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it's kind of a, you know, I think people often will confuse management mm -hmm. or being operational with leadership. Yeah. And I often think being a leader is, is, is more like giving people a map to navigate the road as opposed to telling them which road to go on. If that yeah. Makes sense. And what it you totally said, does. Yeah. yeah. Really resonate. Um, I, I, I totally subscribe to that. <laughs> <laughs> I am um, one of the things. I one interesting thing, sort of just jumping back down to your background of breaking the mold. I was recently talking to a C-suite executive at a large uh, Fortune 500 technology company, and she's one of those people who often ends up on the circuit, mm -hmm. uh, giving speeches to women in tech and other things like that. And she was telling me about how. She was recently giving a speech and a common question she gets is about, hey, you know, how do you manage that work-life balance? And she finally got fed up with the question in the sense, because normally her answer was, well, here's how you balance it out. And she would go through these best practices. And she said, you don't, you choose. And the point she was making, which I thought was really powerful, that in life, whether it's work-life balance or it's what career we decide to go into or whatever it may be, we have to make very intentional choices. It doesn't mean 
let's say, family is excluded at the expense of career or the other way around, but that we make very intentional uh, choices based on our values. And I was going to ask you, what role do you think values play in the mix for people in terms of plotting their lives and their journeys? So, yeah, I think, I think values are, are absolutely critical. <laughs> you know, I mean, they, they truly are for me, uh, you know, are, are the, the guideposts, you know, the lighthouse that I used in time, my, throughout my entire career, because, you know, family was always a very important element of my values, you know, and how I raised my girls. And, you know, I, I knew that once I left the Navy, once I, I took the uniform off at my retirement ceremony, I, I mean, I, I know that the nation and the military and the Navy would be grateful for my service, but the Navy and the military weren't going to be the ones waiting for me when I stopped, you know, <laughs> when I stopped go, putting on my uniform. In my, uh, my old profession, we had this phrase, actually, an editor once said to me, said, Jason, go home. The newspaper is not going to hug you in the morning. <laughs> right. Yes. That's a great analogy. You know, the Navy was not going to hug me in the morning. And in order for my family to hug me the next morning, I had to have a family that had stayed with me, you know, that, that knew that, that how important they were to me and, you know, and how, how important they were to my life. And, and, you know, I think that's extremely important. Um, I, I happen to agree that work-life balance is a misnomer. It's a sliding scale. <laughs> There's no balance. Um, and it is a series of choices. But, but and this is the part that really sustained me and galvanized me, even when I was, I was faced with many challenging um, situations and extremely challenging conversations and even more daunting decisions that no matter what I was doing in that, in that domain of my life and for as well and as effectively as I, as I tried to do it, that was not what defined me, you know, being a mom, being a wife, being a partner, being the schoolroom monitor or the lunch <laughs> You know the lunch or the or the the field trip uh, chaperone were the things that tended to define me more than what I was doing in the Pentagon or at work. And, you know, and so, my yeah, mom was a that, teacher, and uh, uh -huh. only once did I uh, attend a school where she taught. But she told me something later that um, that I th found very fascinating. For the brief period, it was just part of a year. She we had moved to Texas. And she mm -hmm. was teaching in the school that, that I was in. And years later, she said to me, when I have to make a tough choice about a student or, you know, a, a really hard decision, I think of my kids and I think about how they're part of the system that mm -hmm. I am in. They're part of, um, they're beneficiaries of the work that I do. And I, I always wonder, you know, when you're, in a leadership role like yours and, you know, you may be removed from the, the, the direct care customer, you know, by many, many steps removed from the patient, you know, it, it just struck me that your, your family, you know, they were your patients, your mm -hmm. brothers and sisters, your yeah. daughters, exactly. your, does it, does, does it help to be able to, to, um, in those moments to, to kind of have that as a either a what would I want for my daughter yeah. or, or the hard work I'm doing right now is what's going to support them or is that yeah. is that helpful? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I mean, and and that was something that that I grew up believing from my father and my grandfather, and that is is you know to give back, but to give back to something that is much bigger than yourself, and so. If what I was trying to do in the DHA and military medicine was to help make a system that worked, that would end up being a use case that would improve the healthcare system for the U.S., then that would help my siblings, my parents, my daughters, you know, and, you know, being able to kind of walk in their shoes a little bit really helped guide me in, in many of those decisions. I remember uh, the last time we met in person, I think was in 
it was January of 2020. And I remember we had said we were going to try and get together uh, yeah. real soon. And it was the beginning of the pandemic and I wasn't really paying yeah. attention to, you know, all of what was going on. I was paying cursory attention. And then all of a sudden I was on LinkedIn one day and I saw you were in the state of Washington <laughs> and for COVID-19. And I was like, huh, maybe <laughs> we should pay attention to this thing. <laughs> How did you end up in Washington? <laughs> oh, it was, it's amazing. I mean, you know, I, of course I was paying attention to it and I was thinking, this is so weird because, you know, we had always done table talks war games about what would we need to do if a pandemic happened. And, and like when I was watching it develop, I thought, oh my gosh, maybe I took off the uniform too soon because, you know, I was, I've been at those war games. I know what we're supposed to do. But then I thought, oh no, I think I'm okay not being in uniform because this is going to be a, this is going to end up being a really, really big thing. I, you know, I, I could see how big it was starting to get, especially when it, it hit New York and then Washington state. And, and that's uh, shortly after it hit Washington State. Uh, there was a friend of a friend of a friend who reached out to me. And, and their first question was, do you know anybody who's recently retired from the military that might be able to help out in Washington State with some of their their efforts there? And I, I started going through. I said, yeah, you know, and I started naming some names. And they go, well, let, actually, let's rephrase that. Are, would you be willing? To- <laughs> <laughs> Oh, they hadn't let you on yet to the. No, no, they were talking. They were, they were talking like in the corporate we stuff, you know. And, and so, right, a very corporate political way yeah, of asking right, somebody right. whether they would do something. Right, exactly. And I said, "Oh, oh!" I said, "Well, what is it that you're exactly? I mean, I've 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 heard what's going on. What is it that you're looking for?" And and you know, they said, "Well, we need somebody." who has deep knowledge in, in healthcare and healthcare systems. And I thought, okay, yeah, that, that kind of sounds like me. And then they said, and we would like, we would like somebody who has ideally also has, you know, a fair amount of crisis management or, you know, being able to help, you know, manage change in a, in a turbulent and ambiguous environment. I thought, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. I know somebody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it sounds a little bit like me. And then, and then they go, and you're, you know, you've just retired from the military, so you know how to give orders and get things done. I said, well, hold on on that last part there. I said, you know, I'll, what I'll many help. people don't know is that yeah. uh, the not listening problem is not, there's no exclusion for the military. <laughs> yeah, right, right. You know, I, uh, so I, I said, you know, I'll, I'm happy to help. And, and, you know, I said, let me, let me come out there and, let's try it for eight to 10 weeks. And if it, if, you know, get something going there and and you like it, that's great. And if not, you need to let me go sooner because you need to get somebody in here. That's fine too. And so it was started out to be eight weeks, eight to 10 weeks. And I ended up staying there for six and a half months, you know, and and just, I mean, I was just thrilled and, and honored and humbled that, that to have this opportunity and to see things up close and, and what was turning out to be, a pretty momentous event. And, um, you know, I think though that it's, it also gave me a chance, you know, because uh, other people have, have made the comment to me about being in the military and knowing how to give orders in order to make change happen. And, and what I've reminded them is that as an officer, as a senior officer, as, as a leader, you know, if I ever had to give a, an, an order in order to get something done, then it was a failure of my leadership. Hmm. That yeah. something's gone wrong at that point where yeah yeah because yeah. the reality is that all leadership whether it's in the military or any other place is about being able to engage your followers and get them to come along. Mm-hmm. I always think about you know why why do we form teams? We form teams mm-hmm. because well we would have all been eaten by lions if not <laughs> yes um, but because we can get Bye. more done together and. It's probably less important to direct than to focus on being able to bring other people around. I remember in the beginning of the pandemic, I learned so many things about rate of reproduction and, um, (laughs) you know, all sorts of all sorts of things I never thought I would learn. But I would um, jump from state to state to CDC to all sorts of places to try and find data and one of the places mm-hmm. that I actually turned to was Washington State's um, mm-hmm. dashboard. It was amazing. Yeah. 
Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, it was really amazing. And I, I don't know whether you were actually, uh, uh, that was a key part of what you were working on. But I do, what I do know is that certainly in the early part of the pandemic, Washington State, even though it had one of the earliest cases, seemed to do fairly well compared to a lot of other states. Um, how were you guys able to accomplish that in, in, in a crisis situation? What or well, what were you able to accomplish? Because I yeah. don't really know that. <laughs> well, you know, I think that what Washington State had was um, they had truly engaged leaders at, at all levels of the government and the healthcare sector and eventually at, in the in the commercial and private sectors, you know, but uh, Governor Inslee was, he was, he was a very strong leader who, who listened and made sure that he had kind of the broadest understanding of the situation. And, and, you know, then he, he reached, he was constantly reaching across all the counties of Washington state. And I think that's, you know, so I think that um, being able to see things in a dashboard, you know, Governor Inslee was really a a proponent of being able to see this and then being able to respond to it and then helping to make sure that he gave the support or, you know, or the authority where it was needed. But I think that the big piece then, too, was was that uh, helping to be a part of how the healthcare system came together at an academic, at a public, and at a private hospital and clinic level along with the, the counties and helping to, to give visibility across the state of Washington of where COVID was happening and, and where they might need some assistance to make sure that they had enough capacity. I mean, that was a piece that, that ended up enduring past the pandemic, which I think, you know, looking back on it, was was something that I was able to see uh, were some of the efforts that we had put in motion during my time there had been sustained and were still moving forward and were helping to keep Washingtonians safe. That and kind of so trustworthy think, communication yeah. that we were all looking for. Yeah. <laughs> well, there was that. And, <laughs> yeah. And, and cross-sector participation and, yep, and yep. you know, a common goal. I mean, um, thinking yeah. about what you were saying about in Washington State having engaged leadership and your comment about, you know, if I have to give orders, I failed and that concept mm-hmm. of driving vision and purpose. And it really struck me that, you know, there might be a lot of confusion among people about what it really means to be a leader. I mean, I was wondering, you know, from your perspective, what, what does it mean to be a leader as opposed to, I don't know, a whether it's a manager or even a bad leader, what is it, what does it really mean yeah. from your perspective to be a leader? Yeah. I think um, being a leader is, is being able to bring out the very best in your system and in your people and being able to help make that change happen because you've, you've helped people express their best talents and helped them to, to develop you know, stronger traits and attributes and capabilities, and that you've provided an environment for them where they have the resources. But more importantly, you know, in that environment is providing them with the belief, you know, and the support that they can do anything. (laughs) And they will not that you know, that they will not fail on your watch. And it kind of um, ties it all that people (laughs) the ties it all back together. But I, but I think there's something really profound in what you're saying there that, you know, one of the things that can kind of limit your aperture is that belief that failure is unacceptable, either because I'm a perfectionist or the person above me is a perfectionist and that, you know, a bunch of bricks are going to land on. Hmm. I mean, yeah. and that, you know, giving people that permission yeah. to really make, yeah, to make their choices and do their yeah. decisions. And thinking about our whole conversation, I'm just kind of wondering, you know, I think about your accomplishments as a as a surgeon, as a leader, as somebody who has led change and, and responded to the pandemic and so many other things. Are there is there any advice that you would give for sort of young people who are dreaming of either breaking the mold or just having impact in the world? 
Yeah, I, I would I would tell people, you know, go for it. You know, it is it is okay to rock the boat. It's okay to break a few glass ceilings. You know, it's it's okay to lean into something that nobody else seems to be leaning into. I mean, we need that. We need that. Otherwise, we won't we won't be able to see the different horizons that are out there, or or see the opportunities that uh, bringing different things together and having a, a better or a different solution. And and you know, I would also encourage people that if they haven't considered spending time in the military, that that would be a, an incredible experience. You don't have to do it as long as I did. Um, I didn't think I was going to stay in the military as long as I did. But anybody who has, you know, served in the military in any way for however long is, has provided a service. And mm-hmm. that is something that, that um, having now since left the military, while I miss people, certain people anyway, <laughs> from my military service, um, it's really uh, that sense of serving a much larger purpose. Yeah. And that, it sounds um, like it was a gift to yeah. you. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm very blessed. <laughs> yeah. A gift to the country and going back. So, so to that thought of like serving a bigger sense of purpose, it's one of the things mm-hmm. that I think I, I often hear people sort of struggling to find their purpose. It, it certainly sounds like, you know, the military and your family and all sorts of things, you know, contributed to you being able to find that sense of purpose and Meaning, I don't know if you've ever read Victor um, Frankel. He was a noted psychiatrist, and he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And, Mm -hmm. you know, boiling, simplifying his theory down completely was, you know, it was he was a Holocaust survivor, and he became a psychiatrist. And there's this striking point he makes about the difference between the people who recovered well from the Holocaust among the survivors and who didn't. And yeah. he said the ones who did the best were the ones who found a sense of meaning. And he said, whether they found the sense of meaning in helping that little girl who was also in the camp or whether mm-hmm. they found that sense of meaning in a flower, you know, outside of the, the walls where they were that, and so, in essence, sort of what he was saying was, you know, Nietzsche thought it was really man's search for power, and Freud thought it was love, but that what it really, what we're all really searching for is meaning. And yeah, yeah I'm wondering from your perspective, you know, what it, what is that meaning, and how do people find it? You know, I I, I think that that's such a profound question, and I think that. I I haven't been as reflective of that because in in that way in in how you just presented it, but I always tried to see things in terms of what it could be, what it could look like if it were to make things better for the largest number of people, recognizing that if it was only one, that was still that was still a win. Oh, yeah. That's powerful. That's powerful. Well, I just wanted to give you a chance for any closing thoughts that you wanted to share with the audience. Um, it's been a great conversation from my perspective, but just if there's anything you want to sort of any closing thoughts. Well, you know, I just, I always enjoy talking to you, Jason, and this is no exception. So oh. thank you for that. And I always, I always appreciate the opportunity to kind of reflect on, on, you know, what, what you observed and, and how that came across to you and then compare it to what I might've been thinking at the time or what I was trying to do and see how close. I try to avoid that personally. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I realized, you know, when I, when my daughter asked me, can boys be doctors too? I realized that while I had been, you know, very focused on, on being a role model and something that, you know, my daughters could look up to and then model themselves after, I realized that there needed to be a little bit more intentionality and thoughtfulness and um, 
and, you know, more sharing that needed to happen if I was, if I was really going to help my daughters become what, what they oftentimes refer to me as, and, and they, they like calling me their, their badass mom. So if I'm oh, going to be trying to that teach is my the best daughters, nickname ever. <laughs> <laughs> I want it. <laughs> I have a new goal. <laughs> so, you know, I realized I had to do more than just be a role model. I had to be more thoughtful. I had to be intentional. And having these conversations with you always helped me become a little bit more purposeful in what I was doing. Well, it's a two-way street. Oh, thank you. It really oh, is. Thanks. Well, thanks for joining us. And thank you all, uh, the listeners, for joining us for this conversation with Raquel Bono. We're looking forward to being with you all again on the next episode. I'm Jason Blair, and this is the Silver Linings Handbook Podcast. We'll see you next week with the next episode.